All right, good morning, everybody. Thanks for being here. Uh, we'll probably have a few more people come in. We're combining all of our Sunday school classes uh, in here today just so uh, everybody gets the benefit of, uh, of this uh, final lecture in our uh, Reformation Conference 2020. Uh, again, we're thankful for uh, Dr. Daryl Hart uh, being here with us. He flies out uh, this afternoon back to, uh, back to Michigan. Uh, and, uh, but we've, we've really enjoyed you being here this weekend and uh, thank, thankful for the bonus of having you here on the Lord's Day. So uh, we appreciate it. Um, let me open our uh, Sunday School class with prayer, and then I'll invite Dr. Hart to come up. Our gracious God and Heavenly Father, we truly are thankful to you, dear Lord, for your providence, for your care, for how you have called us into a saving relationship with Jesus Christ. We're thankful for the work of your Spirit and that he applied that redemption that Jesus Christ accomplished on the cross. We thank you that Christ's righteousness is now reckoned to be our own. We're grateful for a celebration of Reformation Day and for this conference that took place this weekend. We're thankful for all that the Reformation stands for in bringing us back to the truths of the doctrines of grace. We're thankful for how you have cared for your church. We're grateful to be a part of it. We're thankful for your love of your church, and Lord, we express our love for it as well. And we're thankful for this one small branch of your church, the OPC. So we pray, Lord, that as we learn a little more about uh, the Orthodox Presbyterian Church this morning, uh, that you would help us to have a deeper appreciation for this communion. We pray that you would help us to, to understand where we sit in the wider church world. And we pray, Lord, that our love for Christ's church, the body of Jesus Christ, that it would only deepen and that it would grow. We pray for your blessings upon Dr. Hart as he instructs us this morning. We pray this all in Jesus' name. Amen. I don't, I don't normally use a, a computer like this. I apologize, but... Um, Kind of preparing uh, this this talk uh, last night, so I didn't have a chance to, to print it out. Uh, very nice to be with you all. Thank you for coming out. Um, and I should probably say that I'm not sure I'm going to spend a whole as much time talking about the OPC as something that is uh, important to the OPC in thinking about the way in which Orthodox Presbyterians relate to evangelicalism. Uh, I can tie it into yesterday's uh, talks. Many of you were not there, and that's fine. Um, but there has been an ongoing uh, tension, I'd say, between Presbyterians and the ways in which they relate to people who are pro-revival and therefore also pro-born-again uh, experience, which is oftentimes what uh, we associate with revivalism. Um, I'll say a little bit more about the 18th century revivals, so-called first great awakening, sometimes also known as the first pretty good awakening. <clears throat> uh, but yesterday we talked, I talked some, I guess Friday night about Presbyterians in, in the 19th centuries, old school Presbyterians who, who dissented from general trends in Protestant world that was sort of the b beginning of a evangelical consensus or coalition of uh, evangelical friendly Protestants old school Presbyterians separated themselves out of that and the OPC stands in that tradition. But within the OPC itself, uh, the OPC started in 1936 and roughly four years, five years later, the or organizations or institutions of evangelicalism also began. And there were people associated with both the OPC and these evangelical institutions like the National Association of Evangelicals or Fuller Seminary or Christianity Today. There was an overlap between these groups. So within the OPC, there's always been something of an ambivalence about are we evangelical or are we not? Um, the OPC has never joined the National Association of Evangelicals because the national, so the NAE, I'll make it shorter, um, <clears throat> has uh, members in it who are Arminian in theology, at least, also charismatic. So the OPC has found that if you're going to work together for the promotion of the gospel with people like that, it would be harder to do. Um, but 
in the 70s, 80s, Orthodox Presbyterians were maybe feeling somewhat marginal within American Protestantism. Some in the church were arguing for um, uh, becoming more part of the so-called evangelical mainstream, which then was much more conservative, I think, than it is now. Um, <clears throat> and uh, so there's been, within the last 25 years, still sort of an ongoing discussion in our circles about whether Orthodox Presbyterians are evangelical or not, or how we relate to the evangelical world. And some of this, of course, is personal. You have to decide yourselves um, how you relate to, to evangelicalism, but sessions have to do this, presbyteries, general assemblies, and the like. Um, so this is somewhat weird, since many of you were not here over the weekend, so you don't have a familiarity with me, and if I ask you questions, first day of class, students are always reluctant to respond. Everyone's quiet and shy. But some of you were here, so maybe you can respond to these questions. So I will, though, just ask for a show of hands, uh, and if I could, I probably could ask you to bow your heads and close your eyes so that nobody would feel embarrassed. How many of you consider yourself to be an evangelical? Show you, raise your hand. Okay. okay. Maybe half. Maybe a, a people are, other, other people are shy. Um, <clears throat> anyone want to volunteer? What, why do you think that you're an evangelical? What makes you an evangelical? <clears throat> There's that shyness. Uh, people who declare a relationship with Jesus. Is what I was Say that again, I'm sorry. People who declare a relationship with Jesus. Okay. That's pretty broad. Right, right. And I, I mean, but okay. Evangelicalism is pretty broad, too. Okay. But you would, could you include Roman Catholics in that? You wouldn't, but Roman Catholics would say they have a relationship with Jesus. Okay, I'm not. I'm not picking on you. I'm just. I'm just trying to get clarity on this. <clears throat> exactly, that's the problem. Anyone else have a thought? Yes, John. I prefer to go back to the what I believe to be the original definition of evangelical. I believe in justification by faith alone. Okay, so that's a that's a Reformation right. understanding of evangelical, and you can. Some people have tried to say that evangelicalism began with the Reformation. Some people would say it began in the 18th century with the pretty, first Pretty Good Awakening. And then some people would say it really began, and I think this is a better understanding for the current situation. It began with Billy Graham uh, and his, his revivals or crusades in the 1940s. All right, <clears throat> I'll take the pressure off you. Um, a common way that people understand evangelicalism, and this is something that pollsters use, uh, but also people who study uh, religion, who study Protestant history, whether they be historians like myself or sociologists, political scientists, um, three characteristics. Someone who has had a born again experience and committing themselves to Jesus Christ, which is sort of where I think Barth's answer f fits. So that's one part. And then secondly, someone who tries to encourage someone to have a born again experience. So part of being born again is to try to get other people to be born again. <clears throat> and then thirdly, uh, if they believe the Bible is the actual word of God. And sometimes this can get into questions about inerrancy or not. That used to be more of a ca evangelical calling card um, in the 1970s when there was something of a controversy over inerrancy. Um, but more recently, given the nature of evangelicalism and politics, and I really am not going to get into that today, even though this is the Sunday before the election, in case you didn't know, um, <laughs> the um, pollsters use something like uh, asking someone if they simply use the word born again or evangelical to identify themselves. So it really is just sort of a label that, that people use to describe themselves. And then depending on the, the, uh, the, the polling pollster um, conducting these questions, um, you can get many more elaborations of this, um, or some are pretty straightforward. But I think the polling data from the 2016 election that constantly 
uh, showed 81% of white evangelicals had voted for Donald Trump. Something using something like this where people actually just use the label and self-identified that way. <clears throat> um, so what we have here then is um, this emphasis upon conversion. Um, and, and so I, what I'd like us to spend some time thinking about uh, conversion and uh, the way that our reformed standards talk about that. Thank you. Um, and I, I'm giving you a handout <clears throat> that has some questions and answers from the Heidelberg Catechism as well as the shorter Westminster Shorter Catechism. Um, the this would be a, a, an argument for the, the church session approving the purchase of the new Trinity Psalter hymnal. Um, I wouldn't have to make a copy like this <laughs> because the Heidelberg Catechism is in the, the New Trinity Psalter hymnal. Uh, I'm, I'm, just, I'm just saying. Um, <laughs> but for those of you who don't know, and I, and I, I apologize, uh, I, I do enjoy visiting other congregations and meeting people, and I won't get to meet all of you. So I don't have any real notion of how uh, steeped you are in, <clears throat> in Protestant or Reformed history, but the Heidelberg Catechism, if you don't know, is one of the doctrinal standards of the Ref Dutch Reformed churches and German Reformed churches. Um, a catechism coming out of the city of Heidelberg and the Reformation there uh, written in uh, 1563. So it's a fairly early uh, Reformed uh, catechism. Uh, the Westminster Catechism, Shorter Catechism, coming in the 1640s, so about 80 years later, and it's sometimes useful from at least historians' perspective to think about the different ways that people were thinking about the faith in the 1560s as opposed to thinking about the faith in the 1640s because there are some differences. Um, the Shorter Catechism of Westminster is easier to memorize, uh, and it only has... Um, it has 107 questions. The Heidelberg has 129 questions, and uh, the questions oftentimes were not necessarily written to be memorized uh, as well. Um, <clears throat> anyway, so we have here questions that bear on this notion of what is conversion. So I started on, with the Heidelberg with what is true faith, question 21. True faith is not only a certain knowledge whereby I hold for truth all that God has revealed to us in his word, but also an assured confidence, which the Holy Spirit, Holy, Holy Ghost, works by the gospel in my heart, that not only to others, but to me also, remission of sins, everlasting righteousness, and salvation are freely given by God, merely of grace, only for the sake of Christ's merits. Now that doesn't necessarily describe conversion per se, but when it talks about the Holy Spirit working the gospel in my heart, your heart, <clears throat> it gets into this notion in some ways of what it means to be born again, even though the language here is not one of conversion. But it is striking the Heidelberg when they do go on to talk about um, true conversion, <clears throat> unlike Westminster standards. I did not do a word search this time, but I do not think the Westminster Standards, Confession and Catechisms, use the word conversion. Um, anyway, we do have it here, questions 88, 89, and 90 of the Heidelberg Catechism. Of how many parts does true conversion, the, the true conversion of man consist? Of two parts, of the mortification of the old and the quickening of the new man. Uh, Question 89, what is the mortification of the old man? It is a sincere sorrow of heart that we have provoked God by our sins and more and more to hate and flee from them. What is the quickening of the new man? It is a sincere joy of heart in God through Christ and with love and delight to live according to the will of God in all good works. In other words, <clears throat> this, is, this understanding of conversion is really the same as our understanding of sanctification dying to the old man, living to the new man, um, dying to sin, living to Christ. And 
for what it's worth, that is not an instantaneous, momentary, this day, it happened. It's a lifelong process in this older view of conversion. And that's not the way that people, pollsters, lots of us think about conversion. But according to this older view, that is how <clears throat> people thought about it, as synonymous with sanctification, which is a lifelong process or work of grace in us. Um, now, if we then look at the shorter catechism, some questions that may bear on this. Uh, question 31, we have the issue of effectual calling, <clears throat> the work of God's spirit, whereby convincing us of our sin and misery, enlightening our minds in the knowledge of Christ and renewing our wills, he does persuade and enable us to embrace Jesus Christ freely offered to us in the gospel. Um, this is in some ways talking about an interior work of the spirit in us that again could be thought something like a born again experience. Um, and then later on just to talk about what faith and repentance look like, questions 85 and following go this way. What does God require of us that we may escape his wrath and curse due to us for sin? To escape the wrath and curse of God due to us for sin, God requires of us faith in Jesus Christ, repentance unto life, and the diligent use of the outward means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of redemption. What is faith in Jesus Christ? It is a saving grace whereby we receive and rest upon him alone for salvation as he is offered to us in the gospel. What is repentance unto life? It is a saving grace whereby a sinner out of a true sense of his sin and apprehension of the mercy of God in Christ does with great grief and hatred of his sin turn from, turn from it unto God with full purpose of and endeavor after new obedience. And then the outward and ordinary means whereby Christ communicates to us the benefits of salvation are the word sacraments and prayer. I throw that in just to make... Uh, make the point that the Westminster divines and Presbyterians since have thought about faith and repentance in connection with the ordinary means of grace, with worship, with attending to uh, the word preached and um, the word administered in the supper uh, and baptism and the like. So um, it's in some ways there's a corporate dimension to faith and repentance because it uh, especially those, those faith and repentance are built up in corporate worship through the means that God has ordained to sustain his people. Again, that's not the sort of thing that we think about with um, a conversion experience. Um, I was going to bring this up later, but I might, might as well just bring it up now. I, I myself <clears throat> grew up in a Baptist church uh, where there was an altar call regularly at the end of the service my wife's father was a Baptist pastor, and um, she experienced the double burden of him having an altar call at the end of each sermon, and then feeling badly if nobody was going forward, feeling like dad was failing. Uh, I only had the burden of thinking, well, once I did go forward as a, as a five-year-old, um, you know, I don't know if that makes me some kind of... Uh, spiritual wunderkind, but um, I did, did sense some, some sense of sin and need to repent and uh, trust in Christ. Um, but then after that, every time there was an altar call, then I'm thinking, well, what do I do? I've already gone forward once. So you, you can go forward and rededicate your life to Christ. I mean, that becomes part of, of the process. Uh, the man about whom I'm going to say something in a bit, <clears throat> John Williamson Nevin, wrote this this tract uh, called The Anxious Bench, which was written in 1844 against Charles Finney's revivals. And it's one of the most uh, arresting critiques of the psychology that goes on in something like an altar call because it puts people in an awkward position that makes them think about themselves, how they're seen by others if they go forward, rather than simply thinking about the claims of the gospel and what's happening in that matter. So even the very sense of calculating where you stand in relation to others um, <clears throat> is, a, is a kind of a curious piece of point about this. Um, 
So, that's an older view of conversion, and it contrasts in many respects with the modern day view of conversion, the born again experience, which I'm not denying that there is something like being born again because Jesus tells Nicodemus, talks to Nicodemus about it in John 3. But again, even there, you might think about whether it is an instantaneous matter or something that is much more of a lifelong process. <clears throat> and of course, in some ways, what's happening with Nicodemus and the, and the, the, the rulers of uh, is Israel at the time, or the Jewish leaders, is, um, is a whole different set of questions than what we have. They're trying to make sense of this guy who may be the Messiah, and they don't know entirely how this is all going to play out. So for their, for their eyes to be open, for the lights to go on, it's going to take some time even for Jesus' disciples. Uh, Peter himself is, is a great example of a difficulty of understanding what Jesus was up to. So I'm not sometimes sure that we can put too much weight upon John 3 for thinking about our own understanding of uh, being born again. Um, but so... An older view of conversion, though, the one that in some ways started it all off, came from George Whitfield, the famous evangelist um, <clears throat> in the 18th century. He was really the, the figure who was the catalyst for making the Great Awakening, First Great Awakening, um, much more of an international uh, phenomenon. Prior to that, it had been localized a congregation here, a congregation there would see people becoming more serious about the faith. Jonathan Edwards, pastor in Northampton, Massachusetts, was one of the early figures in noticing that a series of sermons that he had preached, the youth had responded a particular way. He wrote about that, and that became um, a, a, a book that was published on both sides of the Atlantic. But Whit Whitfield himself drew enormous um, <clears throat> measures of publicity as he traveled throughout the colonies as an itinerant evangelist. And um, he, in some ways, set the standard. And one of his famous lines that historians have also used to identify evangelicalism is this one. Whitfield said, it was best to preach the new birth and the power of godliness and not to insist on the form. For people would never be brought to one mind as to that, nor did Jesus Christ ever extend it. <clears throat> Um, just parenthetically, I should close at 10.15, roughly. Yeah. I don't have until noon. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> but, uh, if you're on a roll, just keep going. Okay. Um, so I want to leave a little time for questions, too. So, um, this, so he thought it was best to preach the new birth and not to insist on the form. Now, what might that mean, not to insist on the form, aside from what new birth might mean? Well, people don't always remember that George Whitfield was a priest in the Church of England. And so if he was going to insist on forms, he might insist on the Book of Common Prayer. He might insist on churches being ruled by bishops. He might insist, too, on the 39 Articles. But he didn't want to be bound by those markers of Anglicanism. He wanted to go and, as he did, minister in mixed congregations. Uh, there would be talks about <clears throat> uh, brethren, uh, Baptists, Presbyterians, Quakers, all sorts of people coming to his, uh, his, his meetings, sometimes in churches, sometimes outside. Um, now, one of the curious things about the first Pretty Good Awakening was that it led to a split in the Presbyterian church between the new side and the old side divisions. The old side was opposed to revivals, uh, at least the kind that Whitfield was leading and the new side was pro-revival. Um, and one of our astute uh, attendees at the conference this weekend asked whether there was any kind of parallel between the old side and the old school, which is one of the uh, topics of one of my lectures, and I actually don't think there is. So we shouldn't try to read too much of 19th century Presbyterianism into this. Um, <clears throat> but why did Presbyterians split over revival? Well, one of the leading proponents of revival, a man by the name of Gilbert Tennant, preached a sermon in 1740 called The Danger of an Unconverted Ministry, um, which is, of course, in some ways plausible on the surface. You wouldn't want 
ministers who didn't believe the gospel. But the question becomes, how does someone come to believe the gospel? Uh, is a conversion experience the sure marker of that coming to faith? Um, and what he did in the sermon was, in effect, identify any opponents of revival as being unconverted. This was a way to sort of win the debate. You people aren't believers because you oppose the revival. But it was more difficult question than that. Um, and he was so insisting that ministers, if they were going to be ordained, had to, had to show a, give some kind of testimony of conversion experience. Also, candidates for the ministry needed to give a similar um, testimony of their, their conversion. Um, and, and this raises a, a really important question, and this is sort of the, the main <clears throat> point that I'm, I'm, I'd like to have you think about today, um, which is what does this do to a, the experience of a covenant child? A child who is baptized in the church and grows up, learns the catechism, uh, and, and is, um, is continually, continually going to church, um, <clears throat> and then eventually even makes a profession of faith at the right age, without having had this dramatic encounter uh, with God, some kind of uh, really powerful experience. Uh, I, I knew myself, even as, as a child, that my conversion experience was nowhere near worthy of the celebrity uh, conversion experiences that you would hear about at, say, Billy Graham Crusades, where somebody had lived a life of crime and they converted, or somebody who had been a drug addict and they became a conver convert, or sexually uh, promiscuous and they became a convert. Well, that wasn't me, so I knew that wasn't you know, much of a conversion itself, but still, um, my mother loved to tell the story to my embarrassment that from an age of two on, I was saying something like God's sunshine looking out the window. I, and they didn't exclude me from the dinner table when they prayed over a meal until I converted or something. So I was reared in a very Christian spiritual environment in a church that did have an altar call, so that was a marker of how you became converted. But this, this question about <clears throat> what do you do with uh, covenant children is one that I'd have you think about through this um, fellow on the other side of the sheet handed out, John Williamson Nevin. He's the man who wrote the, um, the tract I mentioned, The Anxious Bench, and um, he was a grad, he was a, grew up a Presbyterian, as you'll see here, went to Princeton Seminary. He actually taught at Princeton Seminary when Charles Hodge was on leave to study in Germany for a couple of years, and then Nevin went on to teach at Western Theological Seminary in Pittsburgh, a uh, Presbyterian seminary on then what was then the frontier, and then he uh, became a member, uh, a minister in the German Reformed Church, and was a, a theologian professor at Mercersburg Theological Seminary, which was an agency of the German Reformed Church. So this is from his memoirs, as it were, written, written in 19, 1870, roughly. He writes this, being of what, was, what is called Scotch-Irish extraction, <clears throat> I was by birth and blood also a Presbyterian. And as my parents were both conscientious and exemplary professors of religion, I was, as a matter of course, carefully brought up in the nurture and admonition of the Lord according to the Presbyterian faith as it then stood. The old Presbyterian faith into which I was born was based throughout on the idea of covenant family religion, church membership by God's holy act in baptism, and following this, a regular catechetical training of the young with direct reference to their coming to the Lord's table. In one word, all proceeded on the theory of sacramental educational as religion as it ha had belonged properly to all the national branches of the Reformed Church in Europe from the beginning. In this respect, the Reformed churches of Switzerland, France, Germany, Holland, and Scotland were of one mind, and this mind still ruled at the time to which I now refer the Presbyterianism of this country. And again, he was born in 1803. <clears throat> then he goes on off to college, Union College in Schenectady, New York, where he encounters the, the effects of revivalism um, in, for the first time, really, in his life. We had no religion in college so far at least as morning and evening prayers went, and we were required on Sundays to attend different churches in town. 
but there was no real church life as such in the institution itself. All this involved, of course, alas, <clears throat> although alas I knew it not e then, a very serious falling away from the educational and churchly scheme of religion in which I had been previously born and bred. It is hardly necessary to, to say that circumstance, circumstanced as I then was, I had no power to withstand the shock. It brought to pass what amounted for me to a complete breaking up of all my pre previous Christian life. For I had come to college a boy of strongly pious dispositions and exemplary religious habits, never, having, never doubting but that I was in some way a Christian, though it had not come with me yet, unfortunately, to what is called a public profession of religion. But now one of the first lessons inculcated on me indirectly by this unchurchly system of revival was that all this must pass for nothing and that I must, be, must learn to look upon myself as an outcast from the family and kingdom of God before I could come to be either in the right way. Such especially was the instru instruction I came under when a revival of re religion, as it was called, made its appearance among us and brought all to a practical point. It was based throughout on the principle that regeneration and conversion lay outside the church and had nothing to do with baptism and Christian education. It required a, rather a looking away from all this as, as more a bar than a help to the process and were to be sought only in the way of magical elapse or stroke from the spirit of God. Um, <clears throat> in, in my estimation, it's a very moving account uh, of the kind of anxiety this fellow experienced having grown up in a Presbyterian church, having been baptized, having been catechized, having gone to church regularly, and now being confronted, maybe not directly, but with this idea that all that he had done in church prior to this was not as important as a conversion experience. And in some ways, it was a supplanting of all that he had learned before that. So again, uh, one of the objections to uh, born again style evangelicalism is that it, it doesn't have a place for covenant children and covenant faith, covenant religion in it. Um, this is not to say, and there are probably some of you in the room, I won't ask for a show of hands because I may not get, I, you still may be a certain awkwardness here and people may not want to respond. But there are probably are people here who converted as adults, which for them, it may make perfect sense that you would look to your conversion experience then as the beginning of a new life in Christ. But for children who have grown up in a home, Christian home, Christian church, eventually make a profession of faith, the conversion experience really doesn't make sense of that. And I think one of the dangers of, um, of identifying too much with evangelicalism, if it's going to be based on born again Protestant, born again experience, is that what is it, what is it our identification with that saying about what we believe about baptism, about the Lord's Supper, about preaching, the, the means of grace, about what the church does weekly, about what parents do in the home, um, family worship, catechetical instruction, and the like. Uh, these are all means that God has ordained uh, for us to rear children in the faith. Um, and, and now, seemingly, evangelicalism may just sort of cut to the chase and you get the conversion experience and you don't have all of that, that background. <clears throat> um, and so I, I'll conclude and leave a little time here at the end for, for questions. Uh, and as I said yesterday in one of the sessions, pushback is okay. If you disagree with this and want to... I mean, we should all be civil and polite, but if you disagree with this and want to ask me a challenging question, that's fine. <clears throat> um, I don't expect uh, just, oh, this is, just makes perfect sense. Dr. Hart's right. I don't expect that. So, but anyway, this, this um, couple paragraphs here from the RCUS, which was the name of the German Reformed Church, Reformed Church in the US. Uh, there is a Reformed Church in the US today that's much different from the one that was then uh, a big section of the RCUS of that German Reformed Church merged with the United Church of Christ, the Congregationalists, sometimes also known UCC, Unitarians Considering Christ. Ha ha ha. Um, it's really a sad story to see where the communion went. Um, and there are still some 
ministers in the United Church of Christ who come out of the German Reform background are still kind of sort of holding on to the Heidelberg and still trying to lead um, a, an older uh, version of German Reformed ministry. Anyway, RCUS has a 20th century edition of the Heidelberg Catechism. At the back of it, it has this instruction to teenagers, largely, who are about to become confirmed in the, in the church, make a profession of faith. Uh, it, they write, this fitness for confirmation may be called a change of heart, though this is only another name for conversion. This change is not sudden, but runs through years. <clears throat> you have not had any wonderful religious experiences, <laughs> such as you hear about in others. <laughs> They're aware of others around them who are saying that they haven't had those experiences. But the Holy Ghost has done much in you in a very quiet way. Nor need you doubt your conversion, your change of heart, because you cannot tell the day when it took place, as many profess to do. It did not take place in a day, or you might tell it. It is the growth of years, Mark, Mark 4, 26 to 28, and therefore all the more reliable. You cannot tell when you learn to walk, talk, think, and work. You do not know when you learn to love your earthly father, much less the heavenly. This is the reform doctrine of getting religion. We get it religion not in bulk, but little by little, just as we get natural life and strength, so spiritual life and strength day by day. Now, again, I don't necessarily think that this is uh, just obviously true that everyone's going to assent to this. Uh, but I would, would call your attention to this idea of <clears throat> uh, we don't know when we learn to, to love our earthly father. I know in my own experience, I'm not sure when it did, but it did happen. There was a time when he was a real threat to me because <laughs> he was the one who meted out the punishment. But then there was a time somewhere that the switch went on and I regarded him as on my side as well. Um, and I, I think that's a good analogy in a way for the, also the way somebody might come to faith. That over time as you're surrounded by these many things as covenant children are, that you actually begin to appreciate this and identify with this. Again, it may not be true of all people's experiences, but on the other side, part of my point here is to, is to say that we shouldn't try to fit people into a born again experience as well. If this experience is, doesn't characterize everyone, although I think it does move more in the direction of trying to accomplish, make sense of the experience of covenant children, we sh certainly, I don't think, should let the born again experience as it has become so popular uh, among evangelicals become the way that we identify ourselves. Um, so I'll stop there. We have maybe five, six, seven minutes for questions if anyone is so inclined. <clears throat> yes? I was wondering if you might extend this <clears throat> further back to the idea of Whitfield within the um, the Puritans and their insistence upon a conversion experience, right. giving rise to the Covenant children, the children of covenant. Um, the halfway covenant? The halfway covenant. Right. I wonder if that's part of this. I'm wondering, I'm wondering where that comes from. Right. The Puritan is it's such an odd thing. Well, Puritans are, uh, are sort of caught because they do, even going back into the 16th century, um, begin to insist more on a kind of exper experimental, experiential Calvinism. Um, and they be do begin to look for people who become members of congregational churches to give some sort of account of their faith. At the same time, they're baptizing. And, and, and so they have a, a built-in tension here, as it were, between those two things. And that's what the Halfway Covenant, this, this event, uh, in 1662 or so in Massachusetts, which is trying to make sense of, we have kids who were baptized, who didn't make profession of faith, but they become members, and now they have kids. What do we do with those kids? Do we include them or not? And a part of this gets into the politics of the colony as well, because to be a, a voting member of the colony in civil uh, affairs, you needed to be a church member, etc. So they have to make some, some compromises. But So yes, I think that there's a strain of Puritanism that leads to a kind of experimental Calvinism that also makes more sense of a
born again experience sort of thing. Um, yeah. He's a historian, I hear. Um, <clears throat> any other questions or comments? Yes, John. I would, I would say that one of the things that I also think can place the issue is that people are going to have an aha moment at some point intellectually when they're older and realize that they have decided this is, I am a follower of the leader. And so perfectly natural as we're describing for kids to be grown up in that and never have a moment of knowing when that was. But even most of us, I mean, I was baptized in good friend, but it wasn't until I had a son that I truly feel like I was like, man, I really have not followed and looked and obeyed and glorified my Lord as I should have. And so I'm not saying that it was like a light switch that was my right. uh, super moment, but it is one of those things that I do recall a specific time right. that I, I, I decided I really needed to. But see, that, that's a really uh, arresting, poignant comment that I'm going to take from my side. <laughs> Be no, because it's connected. You understood your responsibilities as a father, and that made you think. But it, it is, again, in a context of a relationship you have to a child and, and wife. Um, it, it, so there's a, there's a natural component to it. It's not simply going to a Billy Graham crusade and, and walking the aisle. Um, I mean, I, there, since I've <clears throat> refer, referenced the Heidelberg Catechism here, I can uh, talk about some anec anecdotes where I've known uh, <clears throat> leading elders in the formerly CRC, now the, um, the URC, United Reformed Churches, the conservatives who broke away, um, and also have served on boards of some <coughs> academic institutions, where <clears throat> they grew up in the church, catechized, uh, made a profession of faith, which was sort of the normal thing that everybody did when they were graduating from high school, uh, but then really didn't become all that involved in church life until they had a child. And then they began to take it more seriously. The pieces came together. And then they emerged as elder material as well. They, they were taking it that seriously. So there was much more of a kind of gradual life stages aspect to coming to a greater appreciation, understanding, a deeper piety, growth in, in grace for, for this person or these people that I know. Um, so, you know, I, 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 they're, they're just, and there's so many images in scripture of family life, of uh, organic life, tree, branches, vine, all that stuff, the parable of the, um, the sower, <clears throat> that suggests that there's something, there is a kind of um, natural development aspect to the way that human beings grow up, mature, both as humans, but also as Christians. So. Again, this is in no way saying anything against anyone who was converted as an adult. I mean, I think there's the Paul, Apostle Paul experience, which we can't throw out. I mean, I think there are two models in some ways of, of getting religion in the Bible. Paul, Damascus Road experience, that seems to be um, the desire of a born-again experience to have something like that <clears throat> illumination. But then there's someone like Isaac who grew up never having known other than that he loved God. Um, and it seems to me that that would be much more of a model for covenant children. Ironically, Paul himself, of course, being a covenant child. And then again, being at this really difficult time, great time in redemptive history where uh, something new was happening. Um, yes, Mark. I guess I see it as the pendulum swinging either one too far one way or the other. <clears throat> For me, coming out of like a mainline Protestant background, you had many people who would say, I was baptized, I was catechized, I made it, you know, um, I, I, I take communion, I'm a Christian. And then you have 
the more Baptist decision oriented theology and they're like well I filled out a decision card in the sixth grade I raised my right hand when the pastor gave the invitation and so for either one the the object of the faith is wrong you know for mm-hmm. the mainline person the object of the faith is well I'm, I'm saved by my background and then for the Baptist is well I'm saved because I filled out a decision card in either case, the pendulum has swung too far. Instead of the object of the faith being in Christ, it's on something else. Mm-hmm. Maybe I'll let you have the last word. So, thanks. <clears throat> Thank you, Dr. Hart. Sure. Really appreciate you being here. And again, for just just to help us think through this a little more. Um, uh, American Christianity is an is an interesting uh, <laughs> it's an interesting thing uh, to be studied for I think quite some time to go in the future. Well, let me close this in prayer. Gracious God, we again thank you for your faithfulness, for the way that you work in your church, the way that you work through families, the way that you work through the ordinary means of grace uh, to raise up those who believe in you, to grow them in the grace and the knowledge of the Lord Jesus Christ. Lord, we thank you that for each of us, our story is a little different, and yet each of us shares in and are partakers of Christ Jesus. Father, we pray that uh, as we prepare uh, over the next few moments to gather as an assembly to worship you, uh, we pray that you would make us ready, that you would humble our hearts, that you would show us our great need and, and the high calling of worship. And so we pray, Lord, that even this time uh, in the Sunday school hour would serve as a preparation for us. We thank you, Lord, for your work in us. We thank you for the work of Jesus Christ. And we pray all these things in Christ's name. Amen. All right. We'll, uh,